Welcome back to uh, Math 118. We're right at the top of week three. Um, this week we're going to be finishing up uh, uh, chapter two, um, and then actually uh, we're going to have a test next week on chapters one and two. Look out for more information on that um, sort of later in the week. Um, we ended last week right looking at the relationship between functions and their graphs, right? And and now we're going to actually look at how a, um, how, how the graph of a function can give us information about the behavior of that function itself, right? If, if we recall, the graph of the function encodes the value of that function across different inputs in its domain, right? So let's just say for the sake of example, you know, we'll have some axes here. Let's say we have a function that looks something, I don't know, we'll say like this, okay? Um, this does pass the vertical line test, so we can assume that this is the graph of some function. Um, and as we've sort of seen, right, one of the first questions that we ask a lot is, what is the domain of a function? Um, and then sort of likewise, what's the range of it? And the graph of the function actually encodes that value for us as well, right? If we were to project this... Um, graph down to the x-axis, right? If we take each point along it and project it down, right, sort of like this, just going along point by point. Lines aren't the straightest, but you kind of get the idea. If we do that for the whole graph, what we get is we get this interval right here, right? You know, say uh, this is A and this is B. Right. Well, we can see that when when we project all of these function values down, we get this interval right here. And indeed, the domain of this function is a to b. Right. So so we can get the domain is a to b. Right. This this graph uh, gives us the domain right away. Uh, similarly, we can also do a similar thing with the range, right? So let's do this in, in green now. We grab each of these points, and instead of projecting it down to the x-axis, if we project it over to the y-axis, right, what that does is it gives me a selection of points that serve as outputs for the function, right? Because the height of the graph encodes the function value. Right, you know, maybe we, we, we project this one as well, but we sort of see, you know, if we call, I don't know, if we call this y equals c and this y equals d, right, we see that when we reflect, or when we project, rather, this graph onto the y-axis, we get all of the possible outputs that the function gives us thus encoding the range into the graph as well. We can do this with sort of um, some graphs that we're a little bit more familiar with. Right, let's say, for example, you know, we have f of x, not f of g, f of x is x squared, right? We know what the graph of this looks like. We looked at the parent graphs of it. Um, we'll need axes. And, you know, we know 0, 0 is on 1, 1, and 2, 4. So this, we'll say, is our graph. Okay. Now, if we want to find the domain and range um, of this graph from the function itself, right, from, from this explicit function value, we did that last week, but can we get the same information from the graph, well, uh, let's just sort of follow the same steps, right? If at each of these points, I project down to the x-axis, what do I get? Well, you, you can imagine that this graph is going to continue this way to infinity, right? It's just gonna keep going and going and going. So you're always gonna be able to drop a point down. And so we get that the domain Here's the whole real line, right? Because every point is going to get hit eventually, right? Um, 
but what about the range, right? As I project down back to the y-axis, right, you can sort of imagine like grabbing this whole graph and shrinking it in, you know, shrinking this side this way and this side this way. Well, we're going to project to the entire positive real line, right? No, 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 no part of the graph is going to project down here, which tells me that my range is going to be 0 to infinity. Okay, well, how about we do um, one more of this type? Let's say g of x is x cubed. Throwing down our graph. So it's going to look something, something like this. All right, we know 0, 0 is going to hit 1, and then we're going to go going to get really high after that at 2 comma 8, but we'll just draw it going that way, right? This is the general shape of a cubic function. Same trick with the domain and range, right? As I drop down, you know, points to the x-axis, we're going to cover all of it in the positive direction, and when these negative values drop to the x-axis, maybe it's more like, you know, saying they're going to rise up, but we're just squishing the graph right this way towards the x-axis and with that same sort of logic right this guy is going to continue arbitrarily far to the right and up and to the left and down um we're going to end up covering the whole real line for the domain for the range um, we can sort of grab points and project them over right onto the y-axis and it would seem to me that unlike with um, these places in the um, parabola here, we are going to actually hit this lower axis. And so the range of x cubed is the whole real line as well. And and again, I, I, I know we talked about this one last week, and I'm pretty sure we talked about the domain and, and, and range of x cubed again, but this is just sort of you know, going through and, and rediscovering it using this new sort of graphical means, right? Um, let's do, say, one more. I'm going to describe to you the function in words rather than an, an explicit function right now. Say our graph is of the top half of a circle with radius 2. And then 2 is there. And... I don't have high hopes for this being smooth and nice, but hey, that worked a little better than expected. So let's say this is our graph, right? Um, can we find the domain and range of this? Well, you know, as we saw sort of before, it's not too complicated to do so graphically. We just sort of grab a selection of points and imagine what would happen you know, and, and you don't need to sort of like directly draw these. You can absolutely do this in your head. But if we imagine sort of piece by piece squishing this whole graph down to the x-axis, we're going to get this whole area here, right? So the domain is negative 2 to 2. And that's inclusive. And And just for a quick sanity check, right? We're analyzing this as a function. So I suppose first we should have checked if it were a function. So let's grab our vertical line and bring it across. Well, that would look to me like it's going to pass the vertical line test. And so this is indeed a function. Okay, so we've seen its domain. Well, what, what, what about its range, right? What happens now? Well, we follow the same idea. We project points down, you know, from the graph to the y-axis. And it would seem, actually, that we're going to hit all of these points twice, which is kind of interesting. Um, but my range is going to be this whole strip here. All right, so my range, it looks to me like that's going to be 0, to 2. 
Now I said this was a function, right? Um, and this is a function that we can't actually write in an explicit form, right? The, the top half of a circle with radius two is going to be, say, h of x is the square root of four minus x squared, right? You could totally find this information directly from this function, right? You might say that in order to avoid a domain error, we need that 4 minus x squared is greater than 0, or greater than or equal to 0. So x squared is greater is less than or equal to 4, which means that x is between 2 and negative 2, right? You, you could get the domain from that. And then you could say, OK, well, what about valid outputs? Um, at the extremes of this, when x is 2 and negative 2, then we're going to get 0 as an output, and we're never going to get a negative, so that's how I'd get my 0. For the maximum value, right, you might think sort of like, okay, well, when the magnitude of x is anything other than 0, then we're going to subtract it from 4 and make it smaller, so that my maximum should happen around x equals 0, um, which would mean we're doing the square root of 4, which is 2. And so, as I said, you could get this information from there, but it's a little bit more involved, right, and, and requires a bit more comfortability with the equations and their behaviors. Rather, if you just have the graph, you can almost directly read off the domain and the range. Okay, so now that we've sort of dealt with, with domain and range, right, another thing that we're interested in, right, uh, is determining when two functions are equal or where one is larger than the other, right? So say we have, once again, the graphs of two functions because we're dealing with graphical information here, right? Let's say we have some, some function um, f that looks like this and some function g it looks like this, right? And and we'll say that they're going to continue this way. So starting with this sort of um, quote simpler idea, right? Um, where is f of x equal to g of x, right? Um, and so we're asking this question, right? Of of where is f equal to g? And and we want to use the graphs to solve it, right? If we had explicit functions for these, well, we could do some algebra on it. But what does that algebra mean, right? We're trying to find values of x, right? Inputs where the outputs of f and the outputs of g are the same. But graphically, what that would mean is that if I take some vertical line, right, which, which represents, you know, it, it lines up an input with its single output, I'm looking for places where the output of f and the output of g are the same. Well, it would look to me like that would mean I'm looking for the places where the two graphs cross each other, right? So the points where they're equal are the intersections. And, and, and that, again, allows us to solve these ideas much, much quicker. We're able to just say, well, where are they equal? Wherever their graphs intersect. Right? So they're equal where the graphs intersect. Okay. Well, as, as I said, one of the other ideas that we're sort of interested in, right, is like where is one greater than the other or where is one less than the other? So let's ask that question. Let's go back to blue. Say, where is g of x, say, greater than f of x? Well, once again, graphically, let's take some vertical line again. And what we're looking for, right, if f of x is greater than g of x, that means that whatever value g spits out is greater than the value f spits out for some given input. Okay. Well, what that would mean is that on a single like vertical line strip like this, the g of x is larger than f of x, 
or the graph is above, right? So that would be, we sort of drop this down. That's this whole area here, right? Because anywhere in this interval, my line is no longer vertical for some reason, anywhere in this interval, g of x is strictly greater than f of x, but not on the endpoints because that's where they're equal, right? So th the question, where is g greater than f? It's where the graph of g is above slash larger or whatever adjective makes sense to you, the graph of f, right? So, so because the graph encodes the function values, we can use it to solve these equations and solve these inequalities just by looking with our eyes, right? And I, I, I know that's pretty abstract, right? So let's, let's give an example, right? So let's say, let's say f of x is 2x squared plus 3, and we'll say g of x is 5x plus 6. Um, and, and we want to use the graphs to find where, um, let's say, um, a, where f is equal to g, b, we'll say, where f is less than or equal to g, and c, um, we'll say where f is strictly greater than g. Okay, well, if we're wanting to use the graph to solve this, the first thing we would need would be the graphs, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to sort of sketch the graphs of these um, on our axis, and we actually want them both to be on the same sets of axes. So I'll color code my graph like this. Realized I forgot an equal sign there. In this instance, I'm going to give you the graphs of these. Um, we'll say that 2x squared plus 3 looks like this. That one was pretty bad. Let's try that again. Sure. We'll call that our parabola. Okay, so this is f of x. And we know that our g of x is going to look a little something. We'll say like that. And if you were to graph these on your own, you would find that these points of intersection happen at x equals 0 0.5 and x equals 3. Okay, so now how can we find solutions to these ideas? Well, starting with part A, as we just said, where is f equal to g? Well, wherever the graphs intersect, right? So the graphs are equal at two individual points, right? X equals negative 0 0.5 and 3. Where is, say, F less than or equal to G, right? And what that's asking is, what are the intervals on which the graph of F is below or equal to the graph of G? And that would look to me like it's talking about right here, right? That area, it's equal on the endpoints, and it's all of these areas here, right? When, when we project down the graph of F, we get it significantly lower than the graph of G. So that's going to look something like that, which means we're trying to describe this interval. I'm going to use interval notation in this instance. And we're looking at the closed interval from negative 0 0.5 to 3. And then what about part C, right? Where is the graph strictly greater than G, right? Where is F greater than G? Well, that would be wherever the graph of F is above the graph of G, which trivially, that's obviously going to be all the way over here, right? Because F is extending up. G is extending down, right? So, 
we definitely know we're going to have all of this area here. All right, so let's maybe color code that purple. So all of that is definitely going to be the case. So negative infinity to negative 0 0.5. And what's happening over here, right? G is continuing this way, and F is continuing this way. But F is above G right here, and it looks like G is way, or F, F, sorry. It looks like F is way steeper than G. So that would, exp that, that would seem to say to me that F is going to stay larger than G. And indeed it is. So that means that the other part of our interval is everything this way. So it's going to be union 3 to infinity. Next up, um, one of the other things that we um, find useful, right, looking at it at, at graphs, right, one of the things that graphs are really good at telling us is sort of the trend of the data. Say that we have a graph that looks like this, right? It kind of starts here, and it goes up a little bit, and then it turns and it goes back down, and then it goes up. And it kind of continues to go up just a little bit, right? One of the things that I had said, right, is, is it becomes tremendously useful to look at the trend of a graph, right? And, and, and the trend of a graph is sort of like, where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? And this being pre-calculus, right, we, we, we want to formalize this idea of what do we mean by increasing and decreasing. And more importantly than that, right, like whatever our definition is, it should make sense with our sort of common understanding of it, right? Whatever our definition ends up being, we should be able to look at a graph like this, sort of draw some lines, maybe like that. I don't know, maybe this one should go over a little bit. And we should be able to say that this section is increasing, this section is decreasing, and this section is increasing again. Right, because when I was drawing it, I, I kind of find myself saying, "Oh, you know, let's go up, and then let's go down, and then let's go up again." Right. So, whatever our definition, it should make sense. Right. So, so how can we formalize it? Right. Um, given given the tools that 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 we have, right. Let's talk about increasing or decreasing on an interval. Right. You can't. You kind of can't talk about increasing or decreasing at a point, um, especially with the tools that we have right now um, in, in pre-calculus. Um, so let's say on an interval, right? What would make sense for an idea of decreasing or in increasing, right? Let's, let's start there, right? So if I go a little bit further in my interval, right? Let's say we have some point on our graph. If I take a step to the right, if my function is increasing, I should be taking a step up, right? Versus for when I'm decreasing, if I step to the right, I should be taking a step down. And, and this is how we can formalize this, right? Let's say a function f is increasing. on an interval i, right, i is just sort of the generic name for an interval, um, if, okay, well, let's say f1, or f of x1 is less than f of x2, right? So if f of x1 is less than f of x2, well, since, since we're increasing, so that should happen whenever x1 is less than x2. That makes sense to me, right? And, and we can define decreasing similarly, right? We can say that a function f is decreasing. on an interval i if okay so let's kind of walk through the same idea right um so 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 if we want decreasing 
X1 should still be less than X2, right? Like that, that sort of, you know, it would be weird otherwise. So let's say, you know, whatever's here, whenever X1 is less than X2. But if we're decreasing, right, if we take a step up like this, well, then we should take a step down. That would seem to me that, that we should be saying f of x1 is greater than f of x2, right? And this um, idea, right, of increasing and decreasing, um, it sort of allows us to look at the trends of a graph. And actually, um, uh, a bit later in, in, in the lecture, we'll kind of shift our, our, our perspective and sort of take a little bit closer look at how graphs kind of change over an interval. But let's do a quick example of this increasing, decreasing thing, right? So say we have this function right here. So f of x equals 12x squared plus 4x cubed minus 3x to the fourth. And I'm going to show you what that graph looks like. It's going to look something like this, although I suppose I do need a vertical axis, or else the graph is kind of meaningless. So let's say the graph looks something like this. And actually, later in the quarter, we're going to learn how to graph functions like this. Um, but one thing that we won't learn is actually how to tell where exactly these points are. Um, you'll have to wait for calculus for that. Um, so I'll just give them to you, right? Uh, this one here, right? This um, sort of biggest point in, in its region, it's at negative one comma five. This one's at zero, zero. And this one's gonna be at two comma 32, right? So, so this is our graph, right? Um, and we have a few questions to answer, okay? The first one is what is the domain and range? Of F, okay? And then our second question is where is F increasing? And where is F decreasing, right? Where the standard abbreviation is INC for increasing and DEC for decreasing, just because those words are long and sometimes difficult to spell if you're a very bad speller like me. But we can use this sort of graphical information, right? Let's sort of first look at the domain. Well, if we take all of these points and we kind of you know, shrink them down onto the x-axis, it would seem to me like our domain is going to be all real numbers because we're moving arbitrarily this way. Okay, let's write that down. So our domain is all real numbers. Well, what about the range? As, as we said, the game is to sort of project it down onto the y-axis. And it would seem to me like we're definitely going to get arbitrarily negative, right? You know, these are going to continue here, so you can draw a line over and so on. But it's going to peak here, right? This, this 2 comma 32 is as big as it gets, right? So we're not going to get any larger than that. So that would tell me that the range is going to be negative infinity to 32. Okay, so what's next, right? Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? And again, these definitions that we made are common sense. So we can think about this formal definition to sort of check our answer. But let's just sort of look at the graph and see what our instincts tell us, right? We're increasing. Well, where are we increasing? Well, we're going up right here, so I would guess 
that we're going to be increasing on this interval. And that's going to be negative infinity to negative 1. Where else are we increasing, right? As, as we draw across, right, we're increasing here. And then we, we flip and we start going down there, so that's not good. But then we're going up again right here. So if we're probably increasing here, and then we're dropping down again. So the other interval that we're increasing on would be 0 to 2. And we need to glue these two intervals together with a union. Where are we decreasing? Well, as I said, it looks like we're decreasing here because we're going down. Okay, so the first interval of decreasing would be negative 1 to 0. And then we also seem to be going down here. So that would be union 2 to infinity. And I want you to notice um, that we're not increasing or decreasing. Like this, like these two things union together is not the whole real line, right? At this point, well, we're not really increasing or decreasing because we can't put this guy in an interval where that thing is true. But if we could, then it would be increasing and decreasing, and that doesn't make any sense. So we, we simply say these sort of areas between, right, uh, those are areas um, that are neither increasing nor, nor decreasing, so we just exclude them from our analysis. And, and so from an analytic perspective, right, these points are important, right? These sort of sorts of areas that um, are in between the increasing and the decreasing, right? They, they, they represent the sort of largest point in an area or the smallest point in an area, right? They're, they're, they're important from an analytical sense, right? Because they allow us to find where we're increasing or decreasing. But say our function is, um, you know, say modeling uh, the cost of operating a business or the revenue from said business, right? Now these points go from, you know, a point of analytical intrigue to something of actual use to us, right? They're much more important. So we want to sort of analyze them just a little bit, right? They will play a big role in calculus, but I want to sort of expose you to the idea right now, so that way when you see them, you're a little bit more prepared for them. So I'm going to jot down a quick little sketch for you, right? So, so, so that we can test our definitions against common sense. Let's say we have a graph that does something like this. Okay, we're looking for a definition of what your average mathematician would call um, a like local extrema, right? A a um, local minimum, a local maximum, right? And let me give you the definition, and then I'll explain sort of more in detail the kind of idea behind it. Okay, so so here's our formal definition. Can I add formal above it? Okay, so the function value. f of a is a local maximum value I guess I'll highlight local maximum value because that's one of the words we're defining um, if say f of x is less than or equal to f of a when x is near a. And this seems a little frustrating to me um, when I first saw it, because what does this word near mean, right? Like, that doesn't seem very formal. But what near means, um, so is near a just means in some open interval, Uh, containing a. I'll move the word containing down there. So what this means, right, is it's basically asking you to zoom in, right? 
in no way would you say that this value is a maximum for the graph, right? It gets way bigger all the way over here. But, but what it's saying is if you restrict yourself to some open interval containing our point, right? Or if you were to just zoom in, right? I guess they won't let me zoom in enough, but you know, let's say we zoom in to, I don't know, this box right here. If we zoom into this box, one of the box, um, we can even make the box just a little bit bigger. If we zoom into this box, right, consider this as an open interval, so we're not including the endpoints, well then everywhere in this open interval, the function value is less than right here, right? And so when that's the case, right, we say, we say f of a is a local maximum value, and we say that x of x equals a, right? So the input value a is a local maximum. Similarly, right, say the function value, say in, in, in this case f of b, is a local minimum value. And this proceeds the way you think, right? If, if f of x is greater than or equal to f of a when x is near a, right? So this means the way you would think, right? This, this is near means you're using some open interval containing the point, and everything around it, if you zoom in enough, is greater than it, right? So we can, you know, maybe zoom in right here, and we'll take this open interval here, and everywhere around this, I guess I'll uh, clean up this graph just a little bit, right? So in, in this area, that's weird. Okay. Maybe if I push part, we'll call that good, right? Um, so everywhere around, it would look to me like it's around there. Everywhere around this, in this open interval here, my points are greater than or, or equal to this value. So we say that it's a local minimum because you have to zoom into some like local space around it, right? Similarly, we actually have two little local minima here, except, you know, uh, or we, we have a local minimum right here, right? We, we have to zoom in a lot to get it, but we do still have a local minimum here, right? And similarly, we have a local maximum right here, you know, and, and one thing that I want to sort of bring your attention to is like, you might have to zoom in a lot, right? The, the, the open intervals that show this to be a, a local maximum are much larger than the ones needed to show that this is a local maximum, right? But our definition of near just says that it's in some open interval containing the point. Um, and for completeness, I guess I'll add that, um, for the local min or minimum, yeah, we, we say x equals b is a local minimum. I guess I was using that word before we defined it, but it sort of follows from this definition here. And I should be more complete about highlighting the words that I'm defining. And so one of the things that sort of brought us here, right, that, 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 that I want you to notice, right? Um, and, and, and again, all of these ideas will be explored in extreme depth in calculus. But notice that these local minimums, right? They sort of mark the boundaries, uh, minimums and, and maximums, right? They, they mark the boundaries between increasing and decreasing, right? When you hit a local maximum, that means you're going from increasing to decreasing. And when you hit a local minimum, you're going from decreasing to increasing. 